here the philosophy department and direct the program on ethics and public life. Today's lecture is the first of a series of six lectures organized by ethics and public life on inequalities in the United States today. How deep are they? Why are they as deep as they are? What should be done about them? in the work of organizing these lectures, always with discussions, on a deeply troubling issue of our times. We've had as co-sponsor and partner the Center for the Study of Inequality, and we've also been co-sponsored by the Institute for the Social Sciences and the University Lectures Committee. And this whole series was made possible by the generosity of the Leader Potash Family Fund. Our first inequality is going to be political inequality. And I think the political inequality is especially troubling for many people today. Of course, people are troubled by economic inequality in the United States, but it's alarming that economic inequality seems to reinforce political inequality, which then seems to reinforce economic inequality. In fact, concerns about political inequality due to economic inequality have become so deep that an important part of a major campaign for a major party nomination involves a call for political revolution. I haven't heard that before in my lifetime. I can think of no one who has done more to shed light on political inequality in the United States than our first speaker, Benjamin Page of the Political Science Department of Northwestern University. He'll be introduced by Suzanne Mettler of the Government Department. And then he'll share his view of what's wrong with American democracy. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure today to introduce to you Professor Benjamin Page, the Gordon Scott Fulcher Professor of Democratic Decision Making at Northwestern University. Long before I met him, I had tremendous respect already for Ben Page's scholarship. Time and again, I had taught his landmark book with Robert Shapiro, The Rational Public, 50 Years of Trends in America's Policy Preferences, which draws on decades of historical data to show that public opinion in the collective is stable, and when it changes, does so in reasonable ways. I also admire his book, What Government Can Do, Dealing with Poverty and Inequality, co-authored with James and many others. I had the good fortune of meeting and working together with Ben Page when we served on the American Political Science Association's Task Force on Inequality and American Democracy in 2002-2005. What I discovered is this. Here you have, on the one hand, a distinguished scholar who has been incredibly productive. He has now authored 14 books, 19 book chapters, 43 journal publications, including many in the most prestigious journals, and numerous awards and distinctions. The Camera Award for the Best Book on U.S. National Policy, the Exceptionally Distinguished Achievement Award for the American Association of Public Opinion Research. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I could go on and on. His interests in U.S. politics are broad and wide-ranging, wide encompassing public opinion, public policy, the media, the presidency, political economy, as well as opinion on foreign policy. But at the same time, this distinguished scholar possesses the same level of driving intellectual curiosity that I love among students in Intro to American Government here at Cornell, those who are learning about American politics for the first time. He has a tireless passion for understanding the dynamics underlying American politics, and he is vitally interested in big questions, namely about inequality and barriers to democratic responsiveness. His recent books include Living with the Dragon, 
how the American public views the rise of China, and class war, what Americans really think about economic inequality, who Lawrence Jacobs. He has turned his attention in recent years to political attitudes and behaviors of wealthy Americans, the top 1% of US wealth holders, investigating how they often disagree with average citizens, but tend to get their way in policy making. This interest has landed him and his co-author, Martin Gillis, on John Stewart's Daily Show. In fact, I recommend to you sometime to just Google the interview on YouTube and you're in for a treat. But even better today, we have here with us in person, Professor Benjamin Page. Please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dick and Suzanne. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. And it's, it's a real honor to be part of this, uh, this series on what I think is a very important topic. I was grateful to Suzanne for mentioning some of my academic work because sometimes people skip the first part of the introduction and just say, here's someone who was on Comedy Central. <laughs> and in fact, my children tell me that's the most important thing I've done. Now, this is going to be it, potentially a very grim and depressing topic. So I'm going to try to make it not totally grim and depressing. And one way will be starting by a little upbeat thought about the not so distant past. And that is to remind ourselves that not so very long ago, most African Americans were denied the right to vote in the United States, and that was true 100 years after the Civil War. Very few could vote. But in 1965, under pressure from the Civil Rights Movement, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. Good things can happen in American politics. At the same time, right now, I would say things are in a bad mess. Uh, and all of you are familiar with some of the ways in which American politics are in a mess. It seems to me the number one point is that a lot of Americans are feeling bad. They're hurting. They need things. In many cases, they want some help from government programs. And yet, at the same time, the parties are polarized. Government tends to be gridlocked. It's not delivering help that people want. Political rhetoric is pretty terrible, angry and shrill. Big money is corrupting the system. Just a couple of years ago, some of you can remember that large parts of the federal government were actually shut down in a fight over the budget. And the same thing came surprisingly close to happening this last fall, uh, was barely averted. But in, in a more general way, gridlock has had a whole lot of effects on many different important policy areas. I would say that, that gridlock and inaction have prevented people getting help with job losses with stagnating wages. It certainly stopped immigration reform. It's prevented doing anything about climate change. But even on topics you would think would be simple bipartisan things to deal with, like highways, energy, agriculture. Uh, Congress has had trouble getting anything done. And as far as rhetoric goes, as you well know, President Obama has been a particular target of nasty rhetoric. People have called him a Kenyan-born foreigner, communist, fascist, radical dictator, and so forth. But he's not the only one. Political rhetoric in general seems to be debased. And uh, there are all sorts of attacks aimed at Chinese, Muslims, immigrants, especially from Mexico, gays, women, and so forth. And politicians from the two parties sometimes barely speak to each other. So it seems to me my first job is to try to give you a diagnosis of what I think has gone wrong. And it seems to me that in one way or another, most of these problems are related to failures of democracy. 
democracy in a particular sense that I'll be using. And I'm referring to failures of the government to do what majorities of American citizens want them to do. Recent research indicates that wealthy individuals and corporations in particular have a lot more influence on politics and public policy than ordinary citizens do. And I believe that certain factions of wealthy people, by no means all of them, have in effect blocked a number of policies that most Americans would like uh, to have passed. Now, Martin Gillens at Princeton and I, pardon me, wrote an article, actually this is the thing that got us on The Daily Show. It got quite a bit of media attention and it featured a graph with this line in it, which a lot of people found disturbing. I'll show you the whole graph that the line comes from. Um, and it's based on Gillens' data set. This is a pretty remarkable set of data about policymaking by the federal government. It covers 1,779 decisions over a 20-year period. It's by far, I think, the best source of data to get at this question of who actually influences what the government does. So what this graph shows is our estimate, statistical estimate, of how much independent effect the policy preferences of average citizens have on policy making when at the same time you take account of the preferences of affluent citizens and also the lineup of interest groups. And as you can see from the flat line, it makes virtually no difference in what happens in policy. Whether a large majority of citizens favors a policy change, that would be the right hand end over here, when close to 100% of the citizens favor a change in policy, this is across these 1,800 cases, you get sort of a 0.3 chance it's going to happen. If only 10% favor a policy change, it's about the same prediction. In other words, it appears to make virtually no difference what the average citizen thinks. A rather amazing finding. And it took me a while to believe it. At this point, I, I definitely believe it. By contrast, when you look at the same analysis and pay attention to what were sort of control variables, if you want to look at it that way, in the last slide, if you look separately at the impact of affluent citizens and organized interest groups, it turns out they have a lot of effect on policy making. The lines rise as you go to the right. When small numbers, economic elites is, I, that was probably not a great term. That's the term we're using for the, the roughly the 20% of Americans with the highest incomes who show up in surveys. And as more of them want a policy change, it's more likely to happen. Likewise, with interest groups rising from the left to the right, the more interest groups are lined up, that's an index that I can explain if anybody cares about it. Um, but it basically tells you which side of the issue interest groups are lined up on and how heavily, how heavily they tilt in one direction or another. That makes also a big difference. I should also mention that we did some further analysis on this and we found that among interest groups, it's really business groups and corporations that have the bulk of the clout. If you separate them from mass-based organizations, the business groups have about twice the clout of mass-based ones. It's also true, unfortunately, that the mass-based groups don't represent ordinary citizens very well in the aggregate. There's some fine groups out there, but as a lineup of interest groups, they don't do what David Truman, James Madison, lots of people have hoped they would do, which is represent everybody. However, there's an important qualification to how you think about this. Those graphs had to do with influence. And of course, 
it doesn't follow from zero influence that you never get what you want. I suspect if the average American um, had no chance at all of getting anything good from government, we would see a lot more discontent than we see. This shows, this is a simple bivariate relationship, two variables, between what percentage of Americans favor policy change and what actually happens. And you see the line does rise as you go to the right. That is, if you simply look at what proportion of people favor something, you can predict a little bit whether or not it will happen. That's because a lot of the time, average citizens agree with affluent citizens, who are the ones who have the, the real influence. So that's why we call it by democracy by coincidence. But another point to notice about this graph is Look over to the left, and you see that even when 70, 80, 90 percent of Americans want a policy change, it's only happening on the order of 40 percent of the time. Most of the time, they're not getting it. That's why I'm emphasizing gridlock and inaction. That's really the biggest single way in which Americans are being thwarted and government is not being responsive. It's because of multiple veto points, separation of powers, party polarization, and things I'll have more to say about. So the bottom line from all that to me is that given that status quo bias, that, that inability of government to get things done that people want, I believe one of the main reasons for it is that a few wealthy individuals, factions, um, some corporations, and ideological factions of the party use multiple veto points to prevent action. Um, now let me say something about what it is that wealthy Americans want from government, because none of this would make any difference if they always agreed with the average person. But in fact, there's some major disagreements. And I've sketched there what some of the disagreements have to do with. There's some agreement about what you could call public goods, but the big disagreements have to do with bread and butter kinds of issues, jobs and incomes, and also disagreements about economic regulation and tax policy. <coughs> I can give you a little more concrete idea about those disagreements by looking at some of these data from a, a study that I worked on, which is Chicago area, a small survey, but it's really the best we have at the moment of representing a, a random sample of wealthy people. And these numbers are a little unusual, um, but they they capture a lot of information, so I think they're worth looking at. The basic idea is they show tilts in opinion. That is, you give people a choice of three alternatives, expand a program, keep it about the same, or cut back. If you subtract, <coughs> pardon me, cut back from expand, you get something, think of a sort of teeter-totter image. You get an impression of where opinion is tilting which is very close to the same thing as, as where the median voter is, if you're in the median voter. Um, so as you see, there's some agreement there on the first three kinds of policies. Everybody says they want to expand them. Well, you may pause and ask yourself, well, how come nothing much seems to be happening on those issues? That goes back to gridlock and inaction. It's not only wealthy people who are preventing action. Uh, it's factions of parties and so forth. The environment, they're pretty substantial differences. But very big differences on health care, social security, and there's all sorts of other evidence from the study about specific disagreements about job guarantees, government provision of jobs, earned income tax credit, um, policies that a number of you have learned about or are learning about. Um, and it seems to me that those big opinion differences where you have basically wealthy Americans on the other opposite side, 
a minus sign instead of a plus sign, cut back instead of expand, that tells you quite a bit about why it is, for example, that Social Security, the most popular of all domestic programs, of all programs of the federal government, uh, we keep getting close to having cuts in it instead of expansion. Okay, let's pause for a minute and think about underlying causes and what is, what is going on here. It seems to me that probably one of the biggest things that's happening in our time is global wage competition. Very simple notion, everybody understands this. If you pay people a dollar or two an hour in China to make the same kind of thing just as quickly as an American worker uh, can make it, there's no way you can pay American workers $25 an hour and survive. Cheaper goods will come from China factory or factories will move to China or both. And that means that in the whole advanced industrial world, there's big pressure on jobs and wages. Um, in other countries of Europe, for example, it seems to me governments have done somewhat better at ameliorating that. But focusing on the United States, it's clear that there are at least two big effects of economic globalization. And this is, reflects a comment that Dick made in his remarks that economic inequality in this particular form creates demands for government to do something to help. That's sort of the demand side. But at the same time, it gives corporations and a lot of wealthy individuals more political power. They have more money, they have a great bargaining position. They also, as we just saw, tend to resist many of the programs that large majorities of Americans want. Um, and along with that general problem come these two particular ones that um, the, the status quo bias of the American system, that it's so easy to prevent things from happening. And so it's not just big donors, but it's also ideological factions that can prevent policy change. And as you well know, in the United States, in contrast to most of the world, lower income people tend not to participate. So here's another way of thinking about or looking at the, the, the same kind of thing, which is just to say that any economic inequality produces demands for government to do things, but it increases political inequality, which in turn Towards action, that makes people angry and discouraged. It opens the way, I think, for demagoguery. It makes it very easy to turn anger against scapegoats, whether it's foreigners, immigrants, African Americans, women, gays, anybody who might be seen as different, a threat. Um, when people are suffering and not getting help, they're open to that kind of appeal. But it seems to me the crucial thing here as a political scientist is to say that we don't have to live with this. There are some very simple ways, some of them extremely simple, some of them harder, by which changes in political processes could change this picture quite a lot. Economic globalization would be too powerful to stop. I wouldn't recommend doing it even if you wanted to try. But you can help people cope with the consequences by thinking about how to improve the political process. And I want to say something about each of these six major areas of possible reform. Money in elections, lobbying, party polarization, veto points, who votes, and how to mobilize citizens. A little reminder about money in politics. As you well know, more and more money in US elections is coming from a few very large donors. And this is kind of a striking figure that almost half of all the money going into US elections is now contributed by the top one one hundredth of one percent. That's not the one percent, that's one one hundredth of one percent of wealthy Americans. If my arithmetic's right, that's roughly 30,000 people out of 300 million. <laughs> 
those 30,000 people probably have quite a bit of influence over what the government does. They certainly have a lot of influence over who is elected. So how to reduce the role of money in, pol in elections and politics generally? The Supreme Court obviously has made it difficult to, to do some of the obvious things. Um, on the other hand, there are things that could be done without running afoul of the court. One of them is full disclosure. Because if citizens knew exactly who was contributing dark money to what purposes, it at least would have helped somewhat for people to fight back. A second kind of thing is to overcome the influence of private money, or at least counterbalance it, with public money for elections. If you provide public money, essentially, the private money is less needed, it has less impact, it's likely to buy less in the way of policy. Now, to me, one of the most intriguing ideas for dealing with money in politics is this democracy voucher idea. The notion is every citizen gets a flat amount of voucher, say equivalent to 100 bucks, maybe 200, and can divide it up, say, in increments of $10 to go to whatever candidate or candidates they want. And that would have the effect of giving every citizen, um, once it's all aggregated, every citizen a more or less equal voice in a big part of financing election campaigns. There's some tricky issues about reforms in general, and it's, it's worth paying attention to details. For example, matching is a very popular idea. You sort of look at private contributions, multiply them by five or 10, and give candidates or parties five or 10 times what was contributed in small donations. Not a bad idea, but it's best for empowering the middle class. It's not so great for empowering lower income people who don't have $100 uh, to give and be matched. In the longer run, it seems to me that to seriously deal with, with money in politics, we will have to deal with constitutional doctrines. I have a law degree, it doesn't make me an expert on constitutional law, but I know enough to find the arguments of the court really unpersuasive. And it seems to me it's worth working very hard to change that. Possibly it will only happen by changing personnel on the court. The next major area, and this, this is one of the hardest, is lobbying. Because you really cannot prohibit lobbying. That, that would violate free speech. I don't think we'd want to do it. But I think if you, if you conceptualize correctly what lobbying should be, it's clear what should be done about it. What it should be is presenting ideas to politicians. That is, if a corporation says, that's going to run me out of business, they've got every right to go to Washington and say, don't pass that law. It's going to run me and everybody else out of this business. On the other hand, why give them the opportunity to provide pressure or temptations? Why allow corporations to give money to political campaigns, create dependency of politicians on them, uh, conscious or unconscious willingness to do what the corporations want, and so forth? Why let them get away with implicit job offers? Why misleading advocacy ads, and so forth? The whole way of thinking about corporations as political actors, it seems to me, uh, would be very helpful to change. Another kind of thing that can be done, I believe, is to counterbalance corporate and business power in the lobbying system by strengthening other elements of it. Right now, there's all sorts of evidence um, from social scientists and others that Lobbies are predominantly about business, and um, there are natural reasons for that. Profit-making firms want to be sure they're represented in Washington. Um, but it doesn't mean that's great for American citizens as a whole. One of the things you can do is to build up staff support 
for legislators, this is even more true in the states than in, in the federal government, but it's true in both, give them some analytical ability so that interest groups don't write the legislation the way they very often do, and so that there can be independent analysis of it. Another kind of thing that can be done is, is to help out groups that represent parts of the population that are really very poorly represented now, and that includes low-income people and minorities. The next area for reform, this is closely related to gridlock. As I said, um, when you have separation of powers, it means that if the two parties are fairly well balanced, it's going to often happen that one controls the House, one, the other controls the Senate or the presidency, maybe there's Supreme Court justices left from a party long ago, and you've got big differences among these institutions. So if they all have to act together, one can stop everything. That's one kind of important veto point that follows directly from party polarization. Party polarization mean, meaning the party is standing for very different policies, as of course um, they, they do at this point. Now it seems to me, conceptually, the crucial thing you want to do is make sure that both parties respond to average voters rather than to their particular party donors or their activists, who are often quite extreme. Party activists, that's one of the reasons they're there, uh, their views are not average people's views. So if you build a system in which the parties are responding to average voters, they're both going to have to respond to essentially the same folks. And that, that means the parties will be much less different from each other. So that while you're solving a democracy problem in one way, you also have a nice effect on the polarization and gridlock problem. How do you do it? Well, part of that story is back to campaign finance. If the role of money can be diminished, the role of private money, that's going to help because each party has a bunch of fairly extreme donors, and you can name some of them, uh, you know, who want things that the average person does not want. And who tend to get it simply by making the party dependent on them. So if we can do something about campaign finance, that's one of the ways uh, to reduce polarization. Another way, as I've suggested, has to do with these extreme activists. What can you do about them? I think number one is to put them in a situation where um, parties are running for election in competitive districts. And what that means is that activists cannot just nominate a yellow dog in a one-party district and assume everybody will vote for the yellow dog. Not everybody, but enough. You know, 52% will vote for a terrible candidate um, in November because they like that party better than the other party. One-party districts are, are a terrible source of giving power to extreme party activists, letting them nominate extreme candidates, and then send them particularly to the House of Representatives and the state legislatures. So how do you get more competitive districts? Well, it's not really, no matter what you've heard, it's not really sufficient to prevent partisan gerrymandering. Deliberate gerrymandering is a complicated subject, but it doesn't really lead to one-party districts of the kind that I'm talking about all that often. Gerrymandering is usually aimed at, at fairly close elections that are safe, but just barely safe. You have to also, if you're going to get more competitive districts, you have to pay attention to so-called natural one-party districts, where there's political segregation, say in urban areas where minorities are clustered. Jesse Jackson gets 90% of the vote. Well, one effect that has is other Democrats in Illinois would really love to have some of those votes that are basically wasted. Um, but that's a partisan point. And uh, more on the democracy theme, the point is Jesse Jackson's got no competition. We'd be in better shape if he did. Okay. Um, so 
making districts competitive, that's a big thing. And I, you know, I want to compliment you on your patience here. Sometimes when I talk about political reform, I get the old glazed over eyes response. You know, it can get technical and boring and all that. I think it's really important. And I'm glad, as far as I can tell, you know, some of you are, are, are thinking about this. Um, so another thing is it's important to get citizens involved, defuse the, the party activists by making them think about who could actually win a gen general election in a competitive district and not nominate an, a yellow dog. But at the same time, ordinary citizens have to get more involved. And one way of, of having that happen, we'll be talking about more about that in a minute, but universal voter registration, election day holidays, making primary elections more salient so that people know about them, making it easier to vote, et cetera, et cetera. All of that can also help us not get such extreme politicians elected. Then more generally, polarization is partly about this gridlock point, but so are veto points. When you're thinking about how policy is made in Washington or in a state capital, um, you know, we have this separation of power system um, where most of us are used to having learned that Madison was our really smart guy and we have a clever constitution. There are a lot of good things about it. I think personally that it's a good idea to have the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government separate. Um, I think it does help check ambition with ambition and it, it prevents certain kinds of tyranny. That's really good. I think it's probably not too bad an idea to have uh, two chambers to the legislature, House and Senate. Um, that means things don't happen quite so often accidentally or stupidly. All that's fine, but the fact is that our veto points have got out of control partly because they go beyond just separation of powers. And within each of these institutions, there are things happening that make it very hard to pass good public policy. And one of the most obvious cases is the Senate filibuster. I noticed that people belonging to different political parties change their views depending on who's controlling the Senate. And I think that's kind of short-sighted. It's, it's really not a good idea to make it possible for small minorities of legislators to prevent action, sometimes indefinitely prevent it. Um, the House of Representatives, it's, I, I think people are catching on to this, but it took a while, that the House of Representatives has really gone wrong because we now have a system of one party rule in the House, which never used to be true. It used to be true that the two parties would bargain some and they'd come out with compromises and they'd vote for something which sort of the middle person in Congress, whatever party, presumably that would be a member of the majority party, but toward the other party, some centrist person, um, that's what would get done. Well, the so-called Hastert rule tells us, and it's been used by both parties now, um, the idea is that if you have a slight majority in the House of Representatives, ignore the minority party altogether. Don't let them offer amendments. Um, don't let them get any kind of bills on the floor. And simply only allow votes when you can be sure that your party is going to be happy with it. So for people who like rational choice models and so forth, the difference is between the median voter and the whole Congress, which is sort of a democratic ideal, have the centrist voter prevail, or the median voter in the majority party, which could be somebody way far away from that. Whether you like rational choice models or not, the, the point's basically a simple one. One party rule is very undemocratic. Now, it would be possible to change both, both of those things, the, the use of the filibuster, don't have to abolish it altogether, but for heaven's sakes, at least force people to actually filibuster instead of just threatening. Threats are cheap. You know, why make it so easy for people to grind everything to a halt? That could be done by a simple majority vote in the Senate. 
Likewise, one party rule in the House could be ended by a simple vote. It's going to be harder to deal with the Supreme Court. I'm not going to go into great detail about that. And probably hardest of all, people don't even like to think about it, is dealing with the US Senate, which as a result of that old Connecticut compromise of having two senators from each state, no matter whether they're large or small, you get this bizarre result that a citizen from Nevada or Wyoming has roughly 40 times the influence in the Senate as a citizen of California. And New York is very close to the same. Um, that's crazy, that's very undemocratic. To change it would be extremely difficult. It might actually take two constitutional amendments. Uh, but it's something, if you're serious about political reform, it's something um, to think about. Okay, uh, I'm near the end here, my six reform areas. Getting a more representative electorate, that means something very different from just the standard thing you hear about, oh, I wish more people would vote. And it would be very nice if more people voted, and I think we should work on that. But I believe a more important thing is having a representative group of Americans vote. If a minority is going to vote, let's make sure that they at least represent everybody else pretty well. We know, unlike most of the world, in the United States, lower income people, minorities, are way underrepresented in the electorate. And we know part of that's deliberate. We know there are all kinds of ways uh, the situation can be improved. Um, and I'm going to mention a couple of them. They're up on the slide. The, the crucial one probably is to have universal registration. There's no reason to force people to jump through hoops in order to become a registered voter. Just being a citizen ought to do it, which is true in most of the world. Um, same day registration, which has been tried in some states, has a somewhat similar effect. If you can go to the polling place, register there, and then vote, it's almost as good, but it's a little extra hassle. Um, but a lot of the current reform proposals really do not help this very much because they have a tendency to empower people who already are likely to vote and just make it a little easier to mail in a ballot or, or vote, vote absentee. Then there are things we can do about how elections are held, making it basically uh, a whole lot easier for, for everybody to vote. And if everybody's registered, I think, the result would be a much more representative electorate. And then finally, mobilizing citizens. This means not only to vote, but getting citizens involved in such a way that they're paid attention to in day-to-day -day policy making. Um, and one of, the, one of the topics that I guess you know, it doesn't come up very much in American political discourse, but one of the ways in which we're very unusual in the world is the weakness of organized labor in the United States. It's extraordinarily weak. Uh, um, and that's not just become, because of some kind of global forces that make it inevitable. There have been policy decisions steadily, at least since the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 or whenever it was back there, um, long time, it's been a whole series of policy moves that have made it harder to work for, for unionization. People can be fired, you know, if they try to bring a union uh, and nothing much happens. It's harder to hold unionizing elections. It's harder to make sure they run fairly. Employers have figured out a whole bunch of tricks and so forth. Public policy could be changed in such a way that working Americans would have some group representation. Not only would everybody be going to the polls, but they'd have an organization that was watching what was happening in Washington and the state capitals and doing something about it. And the same kind of logic applies to mass membership groups in general. They've declined uh, over the last few decades, and the decline is probably very difficult to reverse. The main hope I see is virtual groups. And in fact, there are a bunch of virtual groups um, and moveon.org and, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, 
There are other examples of, of really pretty remarkable mobilization through electronic means. Okay. Now, I've said some of these reforms are very difficult. It seems to me some of them, all it takes is public pressure on representatives and senators, some, some noise and anger and so forth, and you could get those rules changed in the House and the Senate. But some of these things are hard, and I believe that it's quite possible that if you want major political reforms at this point, it's worth thinking about a new kind of social movement that's oriented in that direction. So it's worth a glance at history. And the history of the populists and progressives is very complicated, but it certainly included some important democratic reforms, including the right of women to vote. Um, the 1930s were particularly important for empowering labor unions, which gave working people a lot more clout. And the 1960s, of course, for the civil rights movement led to voting rights for African Americans. It took quite a long struggle to get the vote for women. It only happened in 1920, after a whole lot of time of demonstrating, and really the suffragettes and the progressive movement more broadly uh, brought about the 19th Constitutional Amendment in 1920. Likewise, the Civil Rights Movement took a lot of organization and building, starting out with black churches in the South, colleges in the South, and eventually it mobilized people around the country and forced the government to respond. And the march in Selma, which I think we have here, led pretty much directly to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It seems to me that if you are thinking about a, social, a new social movement, it's really worthwhile looking back at those and thinking about what the lessons are, and these are just a few, there are many others. Um, it seems to me really mass mobilizing is the heart of the whole idea. In order to do that, it appears to be very important to get people to see that their lives are being affected. You know, political reform, well, you don't want to get the, the eyes glaze over sort of response. It has to be clear to people that these political processes really affect things they care about. It also seems to be true that in the American political system, sooner or later you got to work through a major party, at least one. Some of these things happened when one party was dominant, uh, particularly in the 30s and 60s. Um, other times in the progressive period, it was really a two-party and uh, it was both parties, Republicans and Democrats. And as I say, third parties can sometimes help as Teddy Roosevelt probably did in 1912. Um, and the People's Party had that amazing election of 1894 in which they scared the hell out of the Democrats by winning a bunch of votes in the South. That's what led to um, the, the Democrats trying to, and succeeding actually in co-opting them in 1896. I think it's, so parties are important. Another thing is, you just can't do anything in the United States of a serious sort in American politics without some affluent or wealthy people on your side. And I think everybody knows by now who studied the progressives that they had a lot of very affluent people who were progressives. Even the New Deal had a corporate wing. Um, and there are a lot of wealthy people, economically successful people who look at the United States right now and are appalled at what's happening. And I think there's some material there for support of reform. And then just sort of a point about compromise. Uh, you do have to be careful about it. It's essential. But I think both, both the populace and the progressives made some compromising kinds of mistakes. So my, my friend Jane Mansbridge, who's a real democracy person, said that equal voice in this slide should be in red. 
Those are the two important words. In other words, it's maybe worth thinking about a new social movement for equal political voice for all citizens. And I would argue that there are at least some stirrings, there are some signs um, of pieces that might be put together into such a movement, early stages. But one of the striking ones to me was, as I've talked to pe people who work in Washington, turns out some of these big organizations have found they cannot get their policies through uh, without political reforms. And they've started, to some degree, banding together and thinking about how you can reform politics. The Sierra Club is the one that really amazed me. They helped put together this coalition. There are also, as you look around the country, there are a whole bunch of very lively organizations. Some of you may well have had contact with them, worked for them, uh, that are working on political reform, sometimes locally, sometimes with national implications. There are these opportunities to use um, electronic media. And one of my favorite little organizations, I always want to give a plug to Demos, they have, they're a little teeny think tank in Washington that does a lot of good thinking about political reform, but there are a bunch of others as well. And the Scholars Strategy Network is a great tool for academics to use to help with reform. And as you well know, some political candidates are speaking out, and I don't actually mean only Sanders. Um, for example, Hillary Clinton supports a number of the same kinds of reforms. I'd like to see her put them more front and center. The, the climate of the times may lead to that. And Donald Trump, for heaven's sakes, is talking about how the system's not working. The logical result of what he's saying is to think about serious political reform. So big question, um, you know, could you actually make this happen? And I, I think my short answer is yes, it's possible. Um, and the, however, it would take a lot of time and a lot of work. And so it's up to people like you to decide whether or not you want to invest the effort and do it. Thank you very much. Why don't you call on people if that's okay? Let me mention that this is, in some ways, this is sort of a, this talk is sort of a tryout for a book that Marty Gillens and I are writing. So your comments and suggestions would be really helpful and if anybody has lengthy ones, you know, maybe you could send them to me by email. Okay, great. Uh, we really look forward to the discussion, and it's one, one bit of advice I want to give to you all. It can be very hard for people in this room to hear what other people are saying if they're not in the front of the room. So would you speak up and, and feel free to uh, stand up so people can hear you clear. Yes. Thank you. I like all the points that you brought up. However, we are still talking within the need of freedom. And we know that what reform means putting the same elements and the same tools and the struggling them again. But how about the real revolution? I guess I'm, you know, I must be an old guy. People tell me I'm an old guy. I, there was a time I was thinking revolution, yeah, you know, in the middle of the Vietnam War and so forth. Um, there were, those were turbulent times. I think realistically in the United States today, it, it's best to work with the elements we have, but reform doesn't just mean moving them around. It means reform means reshape. That's a, that's a very good point. 
And I had actually intended to mention that the, the, the two-party duopoly, you know, sharing power between two major par parties is part of the problem. Um, and that, that they quite naturally want to hold on to power. They make it very hard for third parties to organize. From the point of view of reformers, it, it's almost certain to help to try to work on some of those restrictions and, and relax them. But do remember, if you get excited about third parties, that they, they have kind of this mixed history in the United States. When you have predominantly a two-party system, you can run into Ralph Nader 2000 kind of situations where the backers of Nader got a result that they almost certainly wouldn't have liked. Um, and in, third parties are really hard to organize, but they're also dangerous and unpredictable in their effects. So I would say last resort. Last resort. Yes. Thank you. Um, first, let me thank you. I'm a social movement guy, so I'm delighted to find a student of political behavior taking an interest in social movements. But my question is about a puzzle between two parts of your presentation. Early in your presentation, you seemed concerned, like many of us, about excessive polarization. Towards the end, you seem enthusiastic about citizens' grassroots groups. But does it not seem that the two most successful citizens' grassroots groups over the past half decade were both on the extremes? One was the Occupy Movement, which was well to the left of the Democratic Party. The other was the Tea Party Movement, which has now moved the Republican Party well to the right. So don't we have a tension almost a contradiction between your desire to reduce polarization and your enthusiasm for citizens' grassroots. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important topic. That's a good thing to point to. My concern about polarization is mainly in the legislative process. That is, I don't want the two parties to be polarized. But when it comes to movements, the rules are different. That is, the examples I gave of successful social movements um, from the past, as well as these recent ones you mentioned, definitely came from minority places. I mean, the civil rights movement did not start with a huge popular backing. But the key for, to me for thinking about the role of that kind of movement in a democratic society is it's its job to persuade people. And the civil rights movement did it. You know, it, it revealed for everybody to see the nastiness of segregation, the contradictions with American ideals, and, and so forth. So I'm not a believer in static politics. I think that, that movements, it's, it's perfectly fair to let them try. Now, the Tea Party, calling that a social movement, I'd say, is a stretch. Um, and if, if it is, it so far has not succeeded in persuading very many average Americans. It gets its cloud in the way that I am recommending against, namely by nominating extremist candidates, not by persuading the American people as a whole. Uh, let me make a couple of comments. Uh, one specific one about the Senate, uh, and then you can enlighten me. I looked up the Constitution and I'm no lawyer. It seems to say that the number of senators assigned to a state cannot be changed. That's, that's right. Not a revolution. So that, uh, I that's right. That's, that's exactly, exactly right. And that's why I made that little mumbling reference to two constitutional amendments. Right. There's some other things that make me think we might need a revolution. Now let me compare. I grew up in Chicago in the 30s, and that was a one-party system and it ran everything. And when you wanted to get something done, you talked to your precinct captain, and it got done if there was enough reason to it. So it was the best, it had reputations, machine politics, corruption, it was a lot of that, but the system was effective. Um, when people recognized that they wanted something, and it was clear, but they were, the government was able to respond. Now, I lived in upstate New York even longer, and, uh, in a place two miles from here, and it's impossible 
to get the people to be involved in government in that circumstance. Because there isn't a government. I got my mail from Ithaca. I did not live in the city of Ithaca, the town of Ithaca, and some of my neighbors weren't even in the Ithaca school district. We got water from an intermunicipal water district. We were in a town of Lansing. We finally created a village of Lansing so we could get some zoning, and I was a mayor of that. But people who came there had no idea what you're voting for. And I have no idea, had no idea then, and have no idea now who my congressman is. There's no connection between the government that you're voting for, 8 or 10 or 12 people on the, on the thing, and any natural community. And it's impossible to have people active and so on when there's no natural community. So yeah, we're, all, yeah. we're all Americans. We live in New York State. I, can, I understand why I'm voting for, for when I vote for a senator. Beyond that, there's no connection at all. And, and yeah, that's, that's an important point, I think. That's an important point, and it's true. The American political system is unnecessarily messy and complicated, and part of political reform ought to think about that. Some of those things are hard to deal with, but I, you're, you're quite right. Uh, I have a, a, a question, but uh, first I wanted to pose two questions to a lot of you in the room, which will sort of undercut me in speaking. Uh, one is uh, the people who've uh, uh, been voicing their views and their questions uh, haven't been undergraduates for a very long time. Uh, and uh, we've been speaking about hopes. Uh, I think uh, Ben Page is uh, our fourth major series, and Ben Page's presentation is the most hopeful one that we've had. I would be very interested in knowing, I bet many of you too, uh, how hopeful uh, uh, undergraduates in the audience are, young people in the audience are. You're supposed to be the hopeful ones. It would be interesting if that's not uh, true. And then maybe the other similar request I have is this. It's an enormous strength of Cornell that our student body is so international. And I bet that's true of uh, this audience as well. And I think it would be terrific if people whose primary political experience is from other countries would compare that experience to the one that Ben had described. Uh, my, my own uh, uh, questions have to do with uh, your thought that one party districts give rise to extremism, which is, gives rise to irrational, uninformative, unreflective decisions politically. One is just an empirical question. The districts with a, a huge concentration of suppose from one party tend to vote Democrat in this country, right? The archetypal district of that kind is an urban district. Yes, uh, yes. And as you mentioned, I, I that's a source of strength for the Republican parties because uh, the that's Democratic right. votes are not economically distributed uh, uh, to win elections. It seems to me that in terms of extremism in your sense, going against support for social problems that's very popular in the electorate as a whole, and they're just uh, in, the, in the population as a whole, and they're just uh, hold down their opinions, uh, these uh, one-sided votes uh, uh, in Democratic districts are not so extreme. In fact, they're well, less extreme than the there, there are two, We're, by the way, two issues. Now, so right, right. But there are two problems here that are entangled, and I kind of, you know, lumped them together. It is, there is this representation problem, it's not really just a partisan problem. There's a representation problem that, for example, African Americans are heavily un underrepresented, almost certainly in the US Congress, as a result of electing a few African American representatives with 90% of the vote in their districts. And if, in fact, those districts had their populations kind of uh, dispersed among a number of districts, a lot more members of Congress would pay attention to those people. You can be almost certain of it. 
you know, leave 60% African American districts and to make sure there's some, uh, some representatives. So that's one problem. That is a representation problem though, and that's a whole different reason for doing the same thing, having more competitive districts, not so, so one party. Um, but the other point is, um, you know, I suppose when you talk political reform, the assumption is that kind of maps totally on to Democratic Party priorities. I don't believe that. I think the Democratic Party has big problems, and some of its problems have to do with one-party districts, uh, where we may not think these are extremists, but people can get elected who are paying a lot more attention to big donors or who are paying a lot of attention to some fairly small social group. Um, and so I think, I think democracy is furthered in those two distinct ways by having more competitive uh, yeah. uh, So since we have had several questions on, on uh, the, the title of this now, um, the representation, wouldn't the most useful and most be to disentangle uh, representatives from single districts and actually have a proportional uh, system of, of electing representatives? Absolutely, that's right. If I were designing the system, uh, almost certainly I would, I would design a proportional representation system. That would be a very tough one to get to. I assume everybody understands this, uh, how, I mean, there are different ways it would work, but the basic idea would be that legislators would be more likely to represent the same proportions in the legislature as the people who support them. Um, currently, there are all sorts of ways things, things go wrong. But that's a big reform. It's worth thinking about. Um, the US Constitution is not friendly to that idea, and neither are uh, the, the presidential elections, for starters, are, um, are kind of a natural two-party phenomenon. There are, there are other problems, but I, I think, think that's an excellent point. It's worth thinking about. Yes? I want to return to the, the topic of success. Um, you mentioned that economic inequality gets political inequality and social inequality gets economic inequality. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the point that you mentioned for success depends on political power that's distributed in movements, movement, such as legislative reform, such as uh, social movements. So, is, so um, I guess my question is how, uh, is how, how feasible would something like a political revolution be? But converse on, on a similar note, do you think that a real on election is, is imminent? Because we look at a lot of candidates who you mentioned, such as uh, Donald Trump, or Clinton, Bernie Sanders, who all, who all hit similar points, who are more similar than we would expect. They're more progressive economically than we would expect from someone like Trump. Uh, we see voting behavior deviating from people's economic interests. So maybe, for example, working class folks uh, vote against their economic interests. Maybe they vote for policies that look like the poorest houses that are actually against their economic interests. So what I'd like to ask is, um, is I would I would say if I if I were Bernie Sanders, I would say that everyone would vote for me because that is how we start a political revolution. Quite a few points there. I mean, the the way you started it seems to me is really important to keep clearly in mind. There is a vicious circle. You know, I think it's I think it's quite true that economic inequality leads to political inequality, which makes it very hard to do anything about the economic inequality. That's why I end up with this social movement thing because people power is pretty much the only way I can see to overcome that, and it has to be big people power. It has to be something that's not not just turn out the vote, you know, but a sustained movement. Now, as far as realignment and so forth, you know, I'm, I sort of buy the conventional wisdom that the Republican Party's in trouble. Uh, it's got two wings that are, are just clashing. And um, so presumably something's going to change about that. But who knows what? Furthermore, the party may be in trouble, but it's running most of the state governments and it's controlling the House of Representatives and 
it may keep a majority in the Senate. So I'm not making a prediction. Um, so one of the uh, examples of this is don't feel like their vote matters, and they think that they live in a particularly red or blue state. That doesn't really matter if they vote in specifically presidential elections, but I think that translates to their congressional elections as well, because if you're not voting for the president, you know, what, there, there's a higher turnout for presidential elections than congressional elections. So I guess my question is, how do you think you can incentivize the people of my generation to understand that their vote matters and to get enough people to go out there and vote? That's, that's a really good point. You can see the connection between that and competitive districts. If you can bring about more competitive elections, there'll be more reason to vote. That's more short answer. I, I don't um, have a particular analysis of tonight's argument. I just kind of have a narrative the statement. Uh, and I'll, I'll be brief. I think we have to have a postmodern reconceptualization of what it means to be proletarian. And people that think they're somehow connected to the elite need to wake up to the fact that they're being used as slaves. Particularly uh, business students, economic students, law students, who are being saddled with an enormous amount of debt, who are essentially going to be left behind when it's no longer convenient to support them as a created class. So I think um, you know, that's kind of the big idea, right? And that's, you know, what a lot of people are talking about in the academy. But how do you get to that? So some of the, you know, prudent and uh, prominent members of the intelligentsia that have kind of sequestered themselves inside of the academia um, need to come out and go back and spend time with the people, as you saw in the 20s and the 30s with worker schools and these sorts of things. So the brain power and the analysis that's here in the room that wants to make an impact has to go out and connect, first of all, with themselves and their peers, but then to the people who don't have resources in their neighborhoods and communities to basically create, recreate a people and wake up to the idea of what it means to be proletarian in a society that is looking like there's not going to be any jobs for half of us in 15 or 20 years. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting comment, and it seems to me, I mean, some Americans would be put off by the language of proletarian. In other words, it's not clear everybody wants to be proletarian. Um, no. But, but the reality. basic reality. point that you're making, it seems to me, has a, a lot of merit, which is that this has become a, a kind of a remarkably class-segregated society with a lot of odd thinking about class. You know, who's middle class is all crazy rhetoric, and I, I think it's worth thinking about those comments and thinking about how you can be sure you're in touch with average people if you get involved in political reform. Yes, Richard. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I guess one of the things that I noticed uh, about your examples of, of past reforms that we've got is that they're, like, they're very uh, simple, or, like, you know, Getting voting privileges in limit. That's there's there's no there's no disunity about what we need to do to fix that. It's just it's not a problem. Same thing goes for civil rights movement, etc. And I think uh, for me, a lot of my uh, pessimism about the future comes from the fact that our problems are getting increasingly complex and it's getting increasingly hard to communicate. And I feel I, I honestly feel uh, as a person in, in university city government, I feel underqualified to even you know, uh, tell them what they should what they should do to fix it, and and everyone else I think is even further less left behind because they don't have the resources I have to take their job. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, political reform, as I said, to a, it can be complicated and boring. And how do you, you know, vote for women? You're right; it's pretty clear. But to say competitive congressional districts. Snore. <laughs> um, I have a lot of faith in young people, though, and one young person I have a lot of faith in is Anna Gallen, who I guess is executive director of Move On, who has a genius for encapsulating issues in understanding, understandable ways. I think that can be done with political reform, but it's got to be around concrete stuff. 
you know, find a case of a filibuster where it's just clear that something all Americans want is getting thwarted. And then hammer on the damn fil pardon me, on the filibuster. Um, I, I'm no advisor on these kinds of tactics, but I have faith that they'll, they'll be people out there who can do it. So a lot of what was discussed was centered on the average citizen. And I was curious if something is lost with the overgeneralization of talking about the average American as opposed to focusing on race or socioeconomic class. Because even if you're going to the majority of saying that you want something done, sometimes the minority has a really good idea that really should be passed even if it's not a majority rule situation. Definitely, definitely. And I, I was trying to take that into account to some extent in talking about movements because minority, you think about gay rights, it's absolutely astounding how fast we're going to change. And that did not come from what the average American thought 10 or 15 years ago. You know, that came from a, a movement that did a lot of effective persuading very quickly. I think that's the way to think about it. Um, to me, we can make a whole lot of progress simply by getting the government to be more responsive to the average person. But that's not the end of the story. Yeah, I suppose I had a question about, um, I'm trying to decide how hopeful I should be. Right? Um, and I just need some more data. Um, one, of the pieces, one, of, uh, one of the pieces of data I need is I need to know um, roughly how much uh, political effort I need to exert unit for unit to match the uh, amount of influence that those in the elite have. So I don't know if you have any just rough estimates of that, but yeah, yeah, if yeah. I have to throw my whole life to it, then I'm just going to deal with that spoil. Sorry. Yeah. Division of labor works here like everywhere else, okay? You, to make a social movement go, you have to have some people who will sacrifice like crazy. And really, we're, I mean, the civil rights movement, some people died. Uh, a lot of people spent many hours in dangerous situations. This, this one's probably a little less dangerous, uh, but it still will require hard work by some people, but not everybody. Like simply joining an organization which in many cases involves nothing more than telling them you're a member and sending them 10 bucks, that can actually make quite a difference. You're all busy people, you know, particularly while you're students, you're probably not going to be out there uh, you know, organizing. Maybe some of you will. But my basic suggestion is, don't worry. There are good things you can do that are feasible. Yeah. Um, hi. I just wanted to go back to the, the first graph you threw up of um, the average citizen's influence on policy. Um, and I'm just curious if you, if you know of any sort of qualifications of particular policies it's obviously a very large data set, but what kinds of policies that everyone wanted got passed, and what kind of policies that everyone wanted didn't Oh, my. Uh -huh. Well, I think a good guideline would actually be this little table that I, that I gave you later. Um, that doesn't tell you about all kinds of policies, but the ones at the bottom, the job-related things, you know, it's been a long time since anything much. Think about what happened to homeowners in uh, the Great Recession. I mean, there were all kinds of things the federal government could have done to help people keep their houses. A whole bunch of people lost their houses unnecessarily. Um, and this bears on the two-party responsibility thing. There were Democrats, some of whom I won't name, but held high positions in the Treasury Department and things like that, who, in fact, got in the way of doing anything for homeowners. That's to me, a prime example of the kind of thing that has not been happening. Wage helps with wages, like the earned income tax credit, which was a Republican idea. It's a very conservative notion. Working poor, make sure they get a little more money. Uh, that's been stymied. It doesn't apply to single men. It only applies to families. Completely crazy. There, there are lots of other kinds of bread and butter things that are roughly encapsulated by that last part of the figure. The environment's another example. Cl nothing happening on climate change in Congress. You know, there's some executive action, but nothing in Congress. All kinds of hassles, even about those, those first kinds of things. So you spoke about uh, the environment disasters that are in Kenya. 
the, the, the bipartisan, uh, the two-party system, uh, whether that uh, uses the possibility or the likelihood of uh, reform. Because, you know, most people, I think, come from places that have more than two parties. Uh, and just uh, maybe if you have some examples uh, of how, like, I don't know, the fact that there's two parties has uh, limited reform, efforts to reform, and would that even make sense to go on? Yeah, well, wait, don't reform. say that last part. That's, you're getting too discouraged. Well, it makes even sense even that there are too many, like there are so many different groups within the, the parties, like yeah. using the Republican parties, would it be better if they just broke up and uh, if, all the parties, if there were like five parties? Maybe? Well, as one of you pointed out a little bit ago, a, a system of proportional representation would have the advantage of a lot more flexibility of new ideas coming into the system. So that, for example, as environmental issues became important, green parties in a lot of the world appeared and became very important in Germany and other places. And that happened partly because of the electoral system. But, you know, I'm suggesting taking on a lot here, and I'm, I'm not sure we want to take on the two-party system as a, as a top priority. We're, we're kind of, we're stuck with it. I say, last resort, okay guys, if you can't clean this up, you will have uh, something like a peaceful revolution. You will have a big third party. Uh, but let's scare them a little, like, uh, but, it's, but hope we don't have to do that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, so I too am an optimist. Um, but I'm also a millennial undergraduate, and he brought up um, the way, in order to mobilize citizens, how we need to use the internet, social media, web. Um, and I agree in the sense that we are more connected today than we've ever been, and yet people are still like as uneducated as we could have been without the use of the internet. I feel like as, as far as um, people not knowing that what's going on because there is a transparency. And uh, I don't know if everybody knows the term, but like clicktivism, like nowadays you see everybody sharing things on Facebook and liking posts and um, just kind of sharing um, like online uh, articles and stuff and kind of that being a substitute for you know going out rallying to bring it to the streets. And so we're seeing a different kind of activism today. And so I'm wondering like what are your ideas on how to actually get to people in this day and age, you know, mostly to millennials, um, and pretty much everybody on the internet, but actually using that to our advantage to share information, especially when, you know, these uh, economic giants are people controlling the media and people actually sharing the important information. That's actually a roadblock to what people are even sharing on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's particularly tricky to, to use these tools for political reform, for the, the reason that is obvious to everybody, that it's, it's hard to write the banner. You know, equal voice is the best I can do for a slogan, and even that I'm not sure people are gonna charge up hills about. So that's a problem that has to be dealt with, but in the broader issue of social media and so forth, it's really hard to know whether or not they've had some kind of siphoning off effect. When it comes to very concrete things like police brutality, it's pretty clear to me that there's more, more participation than there's ever been before on that kind of thing because of technology. There are, there are videos of bad stuff happening and people get really upset and they do things. So the challenge is for these political reform issues, turning them into Issues like that which really grab people so that people understand that they're important. Before we thank Benjamin Page, I want to tell you about the next lecture in the series, uh, uh, which will be in um, two weeks, uh, on February 22nd. Uh, it will be about the quality that Americans say they care about the most quality of opportunity. Uh, Miles Corrin of the Economics Department at the University of Iowa will be talking about the uh, realities of opportunity in the United States. The title of his lecture is Too Many Children Left Behind the United States in International Perspective.
And now for a surprising amount of hope, I mean, you really are the most hopeful speaker we've had, deeply informed, so that makes I don't know, I find that strongly, actually. <laughs> 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 well, compared with uh, the gloom, yeah, hopeful but informed, so we can uh, 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 take it to our hearts. Uh, let's thank them.